Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hi there. Uh, I guess it's time for us to put these things away and let's go inside and find out what God wants to post to our profile. Welcome, welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist Church. Hey gang, just wanted to take some time and let you know uh, how we are uh, sharing faith through love uh, here at St. Paul's this week. Uh, a reminder that our, our secretary, Ashlyn, uh, is leaving us. And uh, if you would like to leave a love offering for her, something to show your token of appreciation for all the work that she's done for our church these past six years, please contact myself or Cindy Lowe, um, and, and we'll give you the details on how you can uh, join us in, in wishing Ashland and the Hawley family uh, Godspeed as, as they move to Pencil, Pennsylvania. Um, we have great news. We have hired a new church secretary who has started this week as she trains with Ashland. Uh, please, uh, if you see her around, welcome Sharon Jones. She will now be the lady behind the scenes making the, the church run. And so we are excited to have her aboard um, and, and we welcome her and her family to our family here at St. Paul's. Um, we uh, will be continuing our more to go meals. Uh, this ministry has taken off in ways we didn't think possible. Uh, we started it and we would have been happy if we had 30. And last week we had 75. And, and this past week or two weeks ago we had 75. And this past week uh, we had 95 uh, meals that went out. And this is in addition to the meals that we're taking to our shut-ins, which are free of charge. So if you would like to order a meal, if you live in the Stanton area, the contact information is right there on our Facebook page. Please contact the church office. Uh, this week, I believe the uh, meal is ziti with meatballs. Uh, and the cost is $8 for adults and $4 for children. I believe it comes with salad and a dinner roll and, and a dessert as well. Well, um, and we take all of these proceeds and pour them right back into ministries uh, for the church. In this case, we've been helping out shut-ins in the area. Um, so um, we hold those up to you. We thank you for joining us to worship and continue to look out for all of the great things we're doing to share our faith through love here at St. Paul's. Hello, friends. You have traveled with me on the journey to Bethlehem. Now I invite you to take the journey to the cross. This live actor portrayal will be held at St. Paul's United Methodist Church on March the 28th, Palm Sunday, from 2 to 4.30 p.m. Again, the journey to the cross will be held at St. Paul's United Methodist Church from 2 to 4.30 p.m. Please join us.
Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm going to be reading the liturgy from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 35. And uh, I'll be using the Message Bible version. Then they entered Capernaum. When the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teaching, so forthright, so confident, not quibbling and quoting like the religion scholars. Suddenly, while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, What business do you have to do with us here, Jesus? Nazarene, I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God and you've come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up. Quiet, get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms, protesting loudly, and got out. Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says? He shuts up, defiling demonic spirits, and he tells them to get out and get lost. News of this traveled fast and was soon all over Galilee. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus, He went over to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left than she was up fixing dinner for them. That evening after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot, a secluded place, and prayed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every day, God blesses us with 24 hours. Well, except for daylight savings time today. And then God blesses us with 24 hours and the government takes one back from us. But every other day, we are given 24 hours to use as we see fit. So how are you using that time? that God has given you. Put it another way. Are your days filled to the brim with all kinds of activities, work, social functions, kids' practices, cooking, cleaning, laundry, so much so that you can barely all fit it in? How much time do you leave each day for God? Most of us would probably say that having a relationship with God is vital. And yet, when we look at our schedules, how much of our day do we actually spend in contact with God? Why don't we spend more time with Him? How do we make time to spend with Him? All of these are important questions. And we're going to be covering them today as we continue our series, Be Still, Finding Silence. You'll recall that last week we talked about how Jesus actually began his ministry by going into the wilderness for 40 days of silence and solitude. He was getting away to be alone with God. And we also talked about how this wasn't a one-time thing. 
The scripture says that he would get away to deserted places from time to time to pray and to rest. Today, once again, using Jesus as our model, we'll look at how Jesus withdrew from his busy schedule to be alone with God. Before I became a minister, my last job in the secular world was as the head of security for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. HHMI is a science laboratory. It's also got a hotel, uh, a residential area, uh, a play area. Uh, the Potomac River runs by there. It's this huge campus where scientists from around the world come to work on cutting edge stuff. Several of the scientists that I work with actually have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. As I said, I was the head of security uh, that numbered about 20 officers and supervisors there at the laboratory. Now, several of my employees were, were, were Muslims. And HHMI actually had this thing where it, provide, it provided its employees with a lot of amenities, but one of those amenities was quiet rooms uh, within, the, within the, the laboratory uh, area, within the main building. And so my Muslim officers would actually use these rooms a, as prayer rooms every day at specific times throughout the day, uh, when the time struck, they would, they would go to the quiet room near our command center, they would face toward Mecca, and they would pray. And I was always struck by how they made this a priority. It never interfered with their work. I mean, if something bad was happening that we needed to, to take care of, uh, that, you know, they didn't go to their prayer time. But for the most part, no matter how busy our days were, even on any day, any given day, uh, they still made time uh, to, to withdraw and to go and pray. When it was time to pray, it was their time. And, and, and they never seemed to be embarrassed or apologetic about this. It was just who they were. They put me a Christian who attended church every Sunday, to shame. And I think the thing that really put me to shame was how the Muslims made it a part of their day. It was scheduled. The clock struck the right time, and away they went. They were not gone for too long now, uh, maybe five minutes. But that five minutes was what they needed to be recharged and back at it again at work. How often do we, as Christians, make time for Jesus in the midst of our busy days? Do we prepare for it? Do we schedule that time? Do we have everything we need at the ready? My Muslim employees did. I still have no clue where they kept their Korans, their prayer beads, and their, and their prayer rugs. But they had them, and when they would bring them out and use them when they said their prayers. The clock struck, they were ready to go. There was no way they were going to be unprepared to meet their God, at least as they conceived of him, and to receive the blessing of being in solitude, even if just for a few minutes. See, too often we don't make God a priority, even though we say he is a priority. That's one of those things where we say one thing, but our behavior shows another. See, we often don't schedule him, and we don't prepare to receive him. Would you feel like a priority in someone's life? if they could never take time out of their busy day to be with you, if they treated you like an afterthought, 
if they said you could have five minutes but nothing else, you wouldn't feel like a priority in someone's day and neither would I. And God doesn't at all because that's how we treat him. That's how we treat Jesus. We wake up in the morning and we grab our phones and, and, and we got to see what the weather's going to be, right? And we got to see what's going on in the world and what the sports squirrel scores are. And we got to hop on social media and post about how we slept last night. Then we got to get ready to start our day and you know we got to have some coffee and maybe a light breakfast and we've got talking heads on the TV talking about what happened in the world yesterday and what's going to happen today and they're, they're telling us about the stock futures and everything and then we get ready and we make sure before we leave we snap a photo of ourselves look so everyone can see how good we look as we head out the door into the rat race of life boom away we go. And the day flies by because we're so busy. And then, and then we head on home and we eat dinner and we have a little me time as we Netflix and chill. And then we spend about an hour getting ready for bed once again, uh, checking on everything going on in the world and our phones and what's been happening on social media. And so who said what about who and what everybody else is doing and eating and wearing and when they're going to bed. And then we tweet out our good nights to the world and away we go. Now, if you're anything like most Americans, that is your average day. Of course, if you're also like most Americans, you're being worn out by your average day. We're eating more, we're sleeping less, and as we said last week in this rat race of life, the feelings of being overwhelmed are rising. We're overwhelmed, overstimulated, we're overanxious, uh, uh, all things not going very well in our favor as far as our productivity and our health. And the reason why is, is that we're not taking time daily to renew ourselves, to replenish our energy. We've been disconnected from the one who gives us strength, from God. Too often we approach our relationship with God as an afterthought. It's one more thing to do in a very busy day. If we get to it, great. And if not, well, it's one of those things that we'll keep until tomorrow, right? You can always meet God tomorrow. Some of us make time to be with God, but is it quality time with God, right? Like I know some of you out there actually do spend time in devotion and prayer every day. But what I'm asking you is, is, is this is quality time with God. Are you distraction free when you spend time with God? Are you focused on being with the Lord? Or do you find yourself scrolling your phone or, or talking to other people who are nearer around you? See, our time with the Lord isn't just one more thing we have to do. In fact, I'll say it's the most important thing that we do. Because as the Bible makes clear, intimacy with Jesus must be at the center of our lives. See, we can look at Jesus' own life and see how important it is to get away and be with God. Our scripture today that we just heard read comes from Mark's gospel. And what it does is it describes a hectic but probably typical day in the life of Jesus. It begins with Jesus entering a synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum was a seaside town in Galilee. It was right there by the Sea of Galilee, which is really more like a large lake. And, and it, was the, it was a fishing village. It was the hometown of Peter and Andrew, two of Jesus' disciples. And it says that Jesus goes into the synagogue there in Capernaum and he starts preaching. His preaching is amazing, so much so that the scripture said that he was teaching as one who has authority. Basically, Jesus was preaching the book like he wrote the book. And of course, we know he did write the book. So uh, he's preaching like one who wrote the book, and that's exactly who he is. He's one with authority. And it says that, that, that as he was preaching uh, uh, that, that a demon-possessed man came up out of the synagogue crowd and confronted Jesus there in front of the synagogue. And Jesus heals him. Now, now that was, that, again, the, 
the authority on full display there. That would be enough for most of us, right? I can tell you what, if I'm preaching in church and, and, and driving out demons from people while I'm here, man, that is enough for me. Uh, most Sundays, I don't even do the driving out of the demon part. I just go preaching and I go home and sleep for like a few hours. So that, but, but Jesus's day was just getting started. It says Jesus leaves the synagogue, the scripture says, and goes back to Peter and Andrew's place where he's staying. And then Mark tells us that while he's there, Peter's mother-in-law was ill, that she had a fever and that she wasn't feeling well. And so Jesus goes ahead and he heals her and she gets up and starts going about her day like everything's fine. So there's another healing. Now, keep in mind, this is a Sabbath day and, and, and it's supposed to be Jesus's day off. Right. In the in the Jewish custom and especially at the time of Jesus, you weren't supposed to do much of anything on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a time to worship and it was a time to go and spend time with family and celebrate God's gift of rest for one day every week. And we're going to talk more about that later on in the series, what, 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 what a Sabbath day looks like and how we need that rest. But, but this was Jesus's day off here. And so he's already doing all of this stuff. He's already preached. He's already taught. He's exercised demons and he's healed a sick woman all on what should have been his off day. But that's not all. See, scripture says that as the sun went down and thus the Sabbath ended, uh, in the ancient Jewish times, uh, in Jesus' day, in, in the Jewish people marked the beginning of a new day by the setting of the sun, not the rising of the sun. So when the sun went down, the, the Sabbath was officially over. So once the Sabbath is officially over, people can come out of the house and, and, and see Jesus. And so it says that Jesus uh, uh, looks out the window and he sees that there's a crowd of people coming from all the surrounding villages there. Um, to Capernaum and they're bringing him all of their sick and their demon possessed and they're standing outside of, of the house. So Jesus on his day off works well into the night healing people and driving out the demons. And yet Mark writes this, that very early, now notice he doesn't say not just early, but very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place to pray. So even despite the fact that Jesus put in a ton of overtime on his day off, he still got up very early in the morning to get away from it all and connect with God. See, Jesus prioritized his life around making time to be with God. It's not just about getting away. It's about getting away to be with God. Intimacy with Jesus must be the center of our lives, not a ministry for Jesus. Don't confuse the two. I tell the employees here at St. Paul's all the time, ministry for Jesus is great, but it's not why we do what we do. Intimacy with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus, is why the church exists, to call you into a deeper relationship with the Lord. And that's why we do what we do. Ministries are great and good, but they're not the reason why we're here. We're here to bring into relationship uh, you and Jesus. And, and, and that's what I tell my employees. I'd rather have them praying than doing anything else because I want them to be in an intimate relationship with Jesus. And ministry will flow out of that. See, Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount about this important idea of being intimate with God, of creating a space to be with God, to encounter God. He says in Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The word that Jesus is, uses here for room in the Greek 
means a room in the interior of the house. It would have been a room with no windows, with one door, one way in and one way out. You're not looking outside. No one else can look in. You kind of close the door. The idea here is what Jesus is saying is we need to go into the interior of our own lives, into our own hearts. And we need to shut out the noise so that we can be alone with the one from whom we draw strength, the one who gives us the ability to face another day. See, when we go into that secret place, what you find, Jesus tells us, is that God is already there. Jesus says our Father is unseen. He's in secret. He's in, a, he's in that secret interior room, that interior room inside your heart. He's waiting to meet you there. And when you enter that secret place, your heavenly father is there to open the door wide, let you in and be with you. He actually welcomes you into that interior place. You're in his presence. And as we learn from Jesus, when you're in God's presence, you're going to find the rest, you're going to find the healing, and you're going to find the power to face the trials and tribulations of the day that lies before you. Now, to find that rest, healing, and power, you have to make time throughout your busy day to get away with Jesus. Please make it a priority. The most important thing that you do, again, Intimacy with Jesus must be the center of our lives, not ministry for Jesus. Don't confuse the two. We have to actually work to cultivate times of solitude and silence to meet God in the interior of our hearts. And you cultivate this time by establishing a rhythm of prayer and then sticking to it. So this week, uh, I'm going to offer you three practical ways, whichever one suits you, you get to choose, um, and whichever one suits you of, of establishing a prayer rhythm for your week and to use that to build upon in the weeks ahead so that, remember, it takes about 21 days to form a habit and 90 days for that habit to stick. So if you stay with this practice for more than just a week and you take it out to three weeks, it'll become a habit and after 90 days, it'll be something that you can do for the rest of your life. But it's got to be something that you schedule and it's got to be one that you're going to stick to. So you get to choose. The first one that you could do is you can establish a regular rhythm of praying to God. And this is good for those of you who especially don't uh, uh, or uh, don't have a regular rhythm or have a hard time finding that rhythm. Or for right now, uh, for whatever reason in your life, uh, you can't you can't find something. This is going to be to help you with that. Uh, it's also good for you early birds out there because it involves, like Jesus, getting up very early in the morning. And so what you're going to do is, 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 is pray early in the morning. And this is also great if you've got a, a lot of activity going on in your house because it gives you that quiet time to be away. So as we said last week, one of the biggest distractions uh, that we face is our own digital devices, right? Our cell phones, our, our, our tablets, our TVs, those types of things, they're really a distraction. So, so this week, here's what I want you to do. When you wait, do not look at your phone or any other digital device, your television, whatever, shut them off an hour before you go to bed and an hour and the hour after you wake up. So the first and last hour of your waking hours during the day, you're going to give uh, to the Lord. Okay. So, so during that, that uh, last hour, for instance, before you go to bed. I, I want you to use that time as a time to prepare. So you actually begin the day before uh, pre by preparing. Get everything you're going to need in the morning ready. So if you're one of these people uh, who are already do that, this will be right down your alley. And if you don't, this is a great way to start a very good habit. So, so one of the things you want to get out is your Bible and you want to have your Bible ready. Um, I know a lot of us do digital Bibles for this this 
time right now until you can avoid the distractions. I want you to use your, your good old fashioned, just plain old Bible that looks like that. Well, maybe not quite that big, but you get my drift. And so you get your Bible there. And for those of you who like to journal, maybe you have a prayer journal right there um, um, or some other reading material, devotional material that you're going to use. Uh, worship music. You know, last time I said do silence. Well, well, this week you can add some worship music back if you want. Earbuds if you want to listen to it in your ears. But again, try and lay off as much of the technology as absolutely possible. Get your coffee ready to go and ready to, to brew. Um, so have all that ready. Now while you're doing all that, I want you to go ahead and just review your day. Uh, look at your high points and your low points. Ask God for forgiveness. Thank God for, for the blessings that he gave you that day so you can all go that and then ask him to bless your time with him tomorrow. Now you go to bed, right? And the last thing you want to do is take whatever your alarm clock is, whether it's an actual alarm clock or your phone or whatever you use I want you to set that on the other side of the room so that you actually have to get up and go to it that way you can't hit the snooze button and so when that alarm goes off in the morning get up turn it off then I want you to pray to God and ask him for the strength to stay awake go ahead and you know go into the bathroom get some water on your face whatever it takes to you know get you uh, woken up maybe do some light calisthenics to kind of get that blood fl flowing and then enter your special prayer place with those things that you've prepared, your coffee and your worship music and your devotional materials and your Bible. Go in there and meet God. He's there and he's waiting for you. Now, another way, discipline that you could use, if, if that doesn't, doesn't suit, would be what's called fixed hour prayer. Now, that's what my Muslim uh, co-workers uh, were doing uh, when various times hit, they were going to pray. But it's not a, just a Muslim practice. It's actually an ancient Jewish practice, and Christians have been doing it since the beginning of the church. In fact, uh, Peter, in Acts chapter 3, it, it is, is doing fixed hour prayer when you read about him going up on the roof to pray at, at, at a certain time. So, so this is a practice that we have done. Uh, monks throughout the world uh, follow fixed hour prayer. And what fixed hour prayer is, is you're going to set your alarm to go off three times during the day, sometime in the morning, sometime in the afternoon, and sometime in the evening. And then when it go, goes off, you're going to stop what you're doing and, and, and as soon as you can, like, you know, if you're in the middle of something, finish it and then and stop what you're doing. And you're going to go and, and, and you're going to set aside somewhere between five to 15 minutes to read your Bible and to pray. And so you do that three times a day. And then finally, this is for those of you who maybe are hard time reading or don't like sitting around and, 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 and just waiting there. Uh, you can go on a prayer walk. And you can do a prayer walk in many ways. You can start by walking through your neighborhood or your town. So like, for instance, if you live here in Stanton, you can go for a walk in Stanton. And as you pass by places, you pray over them. So pray over the businesses in your town. Uh, pray over the houses that you pass by. Um, pray for those people who pass you in the street. And you can do this prayer walk at work. So, for instance, you can just go to work and, 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 you know, take a time during the day to just walk around your work and pray for the people in the cubicles and pray for the people in each office area and just kind of walk around that way. Um, you could also do this for you nature lovers, right? This is a great one. You go out in God's beautiful creation, go to a park or, or what have you, and, or, or, or the woods somewhere, and you wander through and you take your walk and just have a conversation with God as you walk walk, praying for the creation and the beauty around you. The, the choice is completely yours. I'm simply asking you to make it a priority in your life and then to do it. See, because the idea of these practices is to do just that. Make, make time for God throughout our day. And if you don't take the time to do that, if we can't find uh, that time in our busy day, then we're quickly going to find that our busy day overwhelms the time we would have had with God. We're we will run ourselves ragged, right? Just going through uh, uh, this checklist of things that we have to get through without taking time to recharge. And we'll also end up confusing our busyness for actually accomplishing something.
But see, if we take the time to get away, if we make Christ a priority, then we can be confident that he will meet us in prayer. And through him, we'll find the peace, the rest, the healing, and the power that we need to make a difference in our lives, in the lives of those we love, and and, and in our work, in in, in whatever field we might be in, and especially in, in our help with the church. That's what a real relationship looks like. People spending time together and making it a priority. Intimacy with Jesus has to be at the center of our lives. And I pray it will be at the center of yours. Amen. We now come to that time in our service where we're going to offer up our pastoral prayer. 
Um, as we do go to the Lord in prayer, there are a few prayer concerns that I'd like to lift up for you folks um, to pray for there in your homes. Uh, we want to be in prayer for the family of, of our beloved Debbie Fallweiler. Uh, Debbie was a very key member of our church. She was such a great worker and just a wonderful person. Um, she passed away and we laid her to rest this past week. Um, and so please keep the Fallweiler family in your prayers. We also would like prayers for Jeff May. Uh, Jeff uh, has been diagnosed with COVID uh, and is having some breathing issues. And so we want to make sure that we are in prayer uh, for Jeff and, and his family. Uh, here during this COVID time. And now let's take all the things that we I've just shared, plus everything on your hearts and minds, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Loving God, you taught your disciples love for one another, love which would manifest itself in selflessness and servanthood. Hear the prayer of your people for our world and all who dwell in it. We lift to you the nations that they may re be rebuilt in justice and in peace, and especially this nation and its leaders. Hear our prayers for the nations. We lift to you this earth which you so lovingly created that as stewards of your gifts, we might thankfully use its resources for the good of all. Hear our prayers for your creation. We pray for this city, the city that St. Paul's is in Stanton, and for cities and villages all around us and around our country that all might work together to strengthen and improve the lives of their citizens. Hear our prayers for the cities. We pray for your church, both here in this community of St. Paul's and around the world, that this season of Lent may be a time of renewal and faith and mission on your behalf, and that together we may learn the path of servanthood toward all humanity. Hear our prayer for your church. We pray for ourselves and our own needs and the needs of those around us whose lives are closely linked with our own. To those who are sick and sorrowful, bring your healing and hope. To the grieving, bring your peace. And to the dying, bring the joy of your promise to us of eternity with you. For these and all our prayers we offer you, trusting in your goodness and in your strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Waves are only waves. Oh, I'm not gonna be.